Gary is a frequent panelist and moderator. She sponsors film festivals around the country and gives master classes in story development and pitching. Let's give another loud round of applause. Thank you. Yeah, it was hard to live, so I know it's hard to read. Um, I have the great pleasure of introducing our guest today. I'm doing something I never do. I'm going to read this because um, I don't want to mess it up. He's uh, just too cool. So I'm going to introduce Mr. John Jennings. He is a professor of media and cultural studies at the University of California at Riverside. He is a writer and an artist of such works as the Eisner winning, Bram Stoker winning graphic novel Kindred and the Parable of Sower. Jennings is the co-author of the Eisner, Eisner Award winning collection, The Black or the Ink, Constructions of the Black Identity in Comics and Sequential Art. Now you know why I'm reading. Um, he uh, also was a 2016 Nasser, Nasser Jones Hip Hop Studio, hmm, Hip Hop Studies Fellows with the Hutchins Center at Harvard University. He co-founded the Black Comic Book Festival of both all around the world, there are several. And um, he is the founder and curator of the Abrams Book Publishing Imprint, Megascope, a line of graphic novels, and that's not even half of it. So please join me in welcoming Mr. John Day. I mean, and, and, and then what? Like, what oh, have you been doing with your life? Recently? <laughs> Recently. Yeah, chasing a toddler. <laughs> yeah, chasing a toddler. Well, that'll, that'll humble everybody. So, I was really excited uh, just to have the opportunity to talk to him, and I probably, um, would, once I knew he was coming, I probably would have stopped him if I wasn't able to moderate, so it's, it's kept me above board. Um, I really want to start with something that is so straightforward because I feel like when we're talking Afrofuturism, everybody has um, their perception of what it is, but I don't know that we have um, an idea of how broad it is, what it encompasses. So I really want to start with something really straightforward so we're all on the same page and just ask, what is Afrofuturism? Okay. Um, so, the, the term Afrofuturism comes from a, um, an article by Mark Derry, who was a media scholar, and he was basically looking at um, the creation of like black technoculture in the early 90s. There was this thing called the, the World Wide Web, are you familiar with that? Yeah, okay, just want to make sure, staying on the same page. No, but seriously, so it was at the beginning of like, you know, the, the internet, and you know, a lot of it was dealing with like the ennui around like, um, Blackness in America at the time, but also how we were starting to use like technoculture. So he was basically looking at like idioms of like science fiction, like cyborgs and time travel and stuff like that, and how they could be used for like metaphors around um, what it meant to be black in America in particular or throughout the diaspora. So one thing that's interesting about it though is that um, he starts with the idea of like what, where are all the black science fiction writers, which is where he started. Now what's interesting is that. At the time, you know, thinking about like science fiction, yes, you have people like Octavia Butler and Stephen Barnes and Sam Delaney, but if you think about like what speculative fiction actually is, it starts way early. We're just talking about this in the early 1900s, even, right? So, what I say, because in that particular uh, definition that he uses, he talks about 20th century technoculture, which I thought was really interesting because it's like, well, how are we, how are we talking about the future? and it's like 20th century, <laughs> right? Anyway, so I'll say it's an Afrocentric critical making theory and practice that uses speculative sci-fi narratives to reimagine the past, interrogate the present, and design a future where people of the African diaspora thrive in accordance to their own agency, right? So let's, let's break down, down a little bit. So critical making, right? Any, any artists in the, in the audience? Okay, so when you're making an art piece, you do a lot of research, right? You read books, you think about these things, you, 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 you make sketches, you make notes. That's the type of research, right? So a lot of times that might end up as a, a, a dissertation or a book or what have you, but sometimes it ends up as a dance piece or a play or a poem or a comic book or a film, right? That's critical making. So instead of like, so critical thinking and critical making. So that means like all of the arts that we do 
can be used in Afrofuturism. Comments, uh, like I said, interpretive things. <laughs> no, seriously, that's just, <laughs> all this kind of stuff. Um, the other thing, too, is that speculative. Speculative narratives, basically, like anything that's not considered of the real world, so to speak. Right? So, if you have a black fairy on a spaceship, speculative. <laughs> right? um, the other thing is really speculative is race as well. I mean, race itself is an invention, right? So, we're talking about the fictive novel or the, or the new idea of race and how like Afrofuturism can like deconstruct that idea too. So, we've been doing this for a very long time. You know, we're always imagining, as you said earlier, um, a better space to be in, you know, somewhere else that we could be. Uh, one of my favorite quotes by Sun Ra, the uh, Afrofuturist jazz musician, um, he said, the impossible attracts me because everything's already been done and the world didn't change. I know, right? I just got, I just said it and I got chills. I'm like, and the world didn't change. You know, and so he created a whole other world to be in, right? So with his music, he used his music to, to create a world that he could then project himself in his own image, into the future, the past, where he wanted to go, right? And so it's through this speculation that we can actually get at the, the, the strangeness of what, what it means even to be called black in, in like a, an oppressive space that we are. And the other thing too is that Afrofuturism deals with the idea that we've already survived an apocalypse. The Amafa, right? The slave trade, right? We, we're already like past that. We are, we're already in a, in a past dystopian future. So we gotta, everything's gotta get better, right? So that's, those are things that Afrofuturism, I think, uh, get into. Um, now I do have some tenets I can go through, but you have quite, you have any more questions? I can we can flow. I mean, I have a thousand questions, and I think what's so interesting and important is that, as you said, you know, we come from a people who had nothing but hope for a different future. That's right. So, you know, it was ingrained in us to have that kind of creativity mm -hmm. to imagine what could be, based on nothing that was at that time, reality. That's right, that's right. I mean, it could be called faith-based creating, what have you, right? Um, I've also stated, like, right now, we, we're in a spot where it's like, I've never seen this much black speculative content in across the board, ever. Like, actually, even more than the black arts movement. And, and here's the thing, it's not because, um, well, one of the reasons is kind of the fact that we actually have uh, access to the tools to make work and to put out our own ideas and we actually be able to connect a lot easier, you know? But we've actually been able to put out a lot of speculative fiction, a lot of work like that. Um, but I've oft often stated, like, the Harlem Renaissance, uh, the Black Power Movement, Afro-Cobra, all these different arts movements, they have a speculative component to them, right? Um, we were just talking about the fact that uh, Pauline Hopkins wrote Of One Blood in, like, 1902. Right? 1902, Of One Blood is a story about Paul Lee Hopkins about a man who um, can kind of phenotypically pass for white, right? He discovers that he's actually a royalty from a hidden African kingdom that's scientifically advanced and has magic in it. Of One Blood, written in 1902. That sounds like Wakanda to me. It does, it's that absolutely. Sounds like Wakanda. That's 1902, right? And then you also have something like, um, you know, uh, Light Ahead for the Negro by Sutton Griggs. Uh, we have white people writing about the future who are like anti-racist people. Like, and I forgot the writer, the, the writer who did this, but it's called White Man's Burden about a future Africa that is the most powerful kingdom on the planet. That's, like they're talking about like 5,000 years in the future, right? So this is written in like the early 1900s. So this idea of like race and science fiction is something that's, that way precedes Afrofuturism as a space. And we could talk more about that too. But um, one of the first things, I don't know if you remember this piece right here by, um, oh, what's her name? Ingrid LaFleur. Ingrid LaFleur, and I'll talk about her later, she actually ran for mayor for Detroit on an Afrofuturist pr platform, right? Oh, and one of the things she put up, me too, she was like, there are people, there are black people in the future, right? And amazingly what she's stating is that if you look at like science fiction from like its inception to say around early 1960s, there are no any black folk. There's no people of color at all in the future, right? It's like, did, they, did a plague wipe us out? Did we get teleported somewhere else? Where are we, right? So, my friend Lisa Yazik calls Afrofuturism a reclamation of the history of the future, right? It's rethinking the history of the future. 
So basically thinking about the fact that we can actually place ourselves in those narratives, right? So a lot of y'all are probably like Star, uh, Star Trek fans, right? Michelle Nichols was a gro was groundbreaking Afrofuturist for her to be in that space, even though for the longest time I thought her first name was Lieutenant. <laughs> it's Neota, by the way. Okay, Neota. I don't know when they gave her that name, but it was like Lieutenant Uhuru, right? We don't know where she was from exactly, what part of Africa she was from, but she was there in the future. And you guys probably know the story about like Dr. King stopping her from, like asking her to not, uh, to not quit, right? Because he's like, that's our favorite show and sister, you represent us in the future. Yeah. Yeah, so representation is extremely important, you know? Anyway, so. And then what are we, what are we looking at? Well, I'm kind of going through a few tenets. I teach three classes on Afrofuturism, right? Um, for the first part of my career, like for the last 20 years or so, I was a graphic design professor. My, my background is in graphic design. I'm a visual artist and a design theorist. And uh, you know, I just kind of, I kind of saw that I was really interested in representation and, and ideas around symbol, symbols and, and things of that nature. So I studied, started studying media, and I became a media studies professor. And I shifted over about seven years ago when I started teaching at UCR. And I uh, created like a class on Afrofuturism and aesthetics, which is like an intro class to, to Afrofuturism. There's a course on Afrofuturism and the visual cultures of horror, right? Horror, right? So we talked like, we just, had, we just had a whole section on Candyman. Candyman, Lovecraft Country, um, we, we, we're teaching Nanny, you know, the skeleton key, all that. It was all in the stories, right? Um, the other thing, too, is I have a whole class just on Afrofuturism and the politics of the black superhero. So that's my Luke Cage, that's your Falcon, you know, all those different characters, right? And um, in thinking about this, I'm like, well, what are some of the things that actually makes Afrofuturism Afrofuturist, right? What are some of the tenets, right? Because what I started noticing happening was like when Afrofuturism this, this time around started happening, because it kind of resurges, right? I mean, we have a, it gets created, it gets posited in, in the early 90s with cyberculture, and it kind of peters out a little bit, but then we see an uptick in the early 2000s again, right? I have ideas about that too, but you know, one of the, I think one of the touchstones was the, election, was the election of Barack Obama as president, because before then, the only time you would see a black president was in a science fiction movie, right? So, oh, we in the future now. And a disaster. We is here, exactly, right? Or was Tiny Lister, right? Have you ever seen the, the Fifth Element? The Fifth Element. <laughs> the created, impact was, I think, Morgan Freeman. Freeman. Right. The world is always drawing when, the, when there's a black person as right. president. Right, Morgan Freeman is the president most of the time, right? Anyway, so, you, but you see what I'm saying, right? That was one of the things. But anyway, um, we started seeing an uptick in Afrofuturist thought and, you know, what are some of these things that, that were happening, but people started kind of sticking everything under Afrofuturism, like, oh, it's black people and magic, oh, it's Afrofuturist, right? Oh, it's spirituality and horror, oh, Afrofuturist. I'm like, is it though? Like, do we, do we like, issue genre? Do we just say, like, genre isn't important anymore? You know? Like, Kindred, to me, is more gothic than Af Afrofuturist. It has more gothic tropes in it. That's why I came with this term, the ethnogothic, right? But anyway, so, first thing is Afrofuturism is Afrocentric. I know that seems like, duh, right? <laughs> but no, it's about black people, it's about black culture, and it's Afrocentric, it's about black people's futures, right? Uh, the other thing is that black folk are using some type of ancestral technology or some type of modern technology. Technology is being used in some way to, to, to basically undergird their survival, right? And this film here, The Gifted, came out, are you familiar with this film? Yeah, came out like nine, early 90s, and I'm forgetting that, uh, Audrey King Lewis. <laughs> Sorry, I got too full of myself, see that? <laughs> Don't tell my wife, she always told me about that. Anyway, um, Audrey King Lewis did this, uh, this piece called The Gifted. Uh, that was based off the Dogon people, you know the Dogon tribe? The Dogon tribe were descended from the Egyptians and they, ha they, have, a, they have a creation mythology that sounds like a science fiction story. You know, it's about this, uh, these people who are amphibians, came from another planet, there's a fiery ship, you know, all this kind of stuff. So it's really interesting. So she utilizes the Dogon mythology and makes this like science fiction movie and they had this like, these gourds that would actually like tell you when evil was coming. I was like, that's, that's some ancient, wild technology. And it's, you can see it on YouTube, you know, but it's hard to find. I have, a, I have it on this thing called VHS. It's, v, it's like a tape. Yeah, it's V, yeah, okay. Also an ancient, <laughs> also an ancient technology. Ancient technology, yes. You have to blow it off. You know, like, anyway. <laughs> 
All right, the other thing is uh, Afrofuturism has a quote unquote black technosis involved. That is a fusion of the spiritual with the technological. Now, I get this term from this, from this scholar named Eric Davis. I wrote this book called Technosis in like 94 or something like that. And he was analyzing the connections between spirituality and technology, right? So when I use the word technology, I'm thinking about like the idea of the prosthetic impulse. Like thing, technology is like something that's an extrapolation outside of ourselves. Not just the computer that we're on, but the systems that make that computer, right? That's also a technology. A book is a technology. Religion, race, all these different things could be their extrapolations of human experience. And they give us the wherewithal to understand the, the environment that we're in, you know, the world that we're in. So that's what I mean when it's a technology, right? It's techne, right? The, the, the outer things, right? So Black Panther is a perfect example of this, right? So what, what, is, what is T'Challa? What is Black Panther, right? He's a superhero? He's a king. What else is he? That's right. He's a spiritually, he's also almost like an avatar of their panther god. Very much like a pharaoh, actually. So not only is he a protector of Wakanda, but he also is a, is, a, is a walking manifestation of their panther god. That's very spiritual, but also the most technological advanced, uh, you know, community on the planet, right? So, in the comic books, you know, he, their, their empire goes in outer space, you know. It's an intergalactic Wakandan empire. It's really dope. It's like Star Wars meets Black Panther. I loved it. I'm a big nerd, sorry. Anyway, um, so, that herb that he takes, right, allows him to access his ancestral technology, right? This is a way for him to speak to his ancestors, right, through this, this, this horticultural piece. It's almost like root work or like hoodoo or these types of things. It's, con it's like, it's, it's very black <laughs> is what it is. So he's connecting to a network of all the Black Panthers that ever lived in history. That's deep, right? That's, I think that's a huge part of Afrofuturism, is thinking about like the ancestral technologies that we have as part of the future and the past simultaneously. So, yeah. I'm just looking. Oh, yes, more. So yeah, so the, uh, this is a piece, it's a, a film called God of Dreams. It's, it's like a, kind of like, um, it's a kind of dystopic world where like basically dreams are being controlled by, by, by corporation and by government and stuff like that and you have this enclaves of like black resistance fighters it's pretty cool but basically it's talking about the idea if you look at like western sci-fi right or the idea of the hero a lot of science fiction is centered around i am very powerful and i shall save the day right which is cool i mean i like that superman batman whatever but a lot of afrofuturist narratives seem to be very communal they think about everyone at the same time like my people first right right and so that's i think also part of it because we have we feel like we have a shared destiny you know one of my favorite things you don't see this the jordan peele uh twilight zone piece so this is a this is a, a, a episode called replay and it's about this camera that can actually re rewind technology but it's re rewind time but it's also about like police brutality and the only way that they survive is through community you have to see it. It's like, I talk about this in my class, it's like the, the, the technology here is communal technology, right? Family, actually, even. Family. So, I've seen Pumzi, uh, written and directed by Wanuri Kahil. This is uh, it's a, Kenyan, uh, a Kenyan science fiction uh, piece. It's set after the Third World War in Kenya, and there's hardly any water, and this young lady is having these uh, samples sent to her from like green samples, like wet samples, like where is this happening, like where is this at? And so she takes on faith and she goes out into the desert and she finds this tree and then basically what happens is that she kind of sacrifices herself and from her all this greenery grows, right? It's, ama it's an amazingly beautiful story. Pumzi means breath, by the way. What I love though is that it, it, there's a, a tendency to not only be about community and people, but also including planet, the planet and being a part of a, a system of life um, that that is absolutely one and the man who fell to earth is yes. very much about yeah. that and it's about a connection beyond ourselves that is almost like a root system mm -hmm. you know for people and the planet your everything is interconnected i promise you that we did not rehearse this but that's exactly what this next comic is about. Ooh, we're yeah. so good yeah, that's it. We're so good. Exactly. So, uh, I don't know if y'all know Victor Laval's work at all. If you don't, get familiar. He's an amazing horror. 
I want to tell you, before we're done, I'm going to ask him to give us all a starter kit of like what we should you know, collectively look at and start reading across oh, yeah. genres. So be I, thinking, like, I'm thinking, this is important. I'm going to send you this, this piece. So his wife researches climate science. She, she, she does work on climate change. And so he worked with Boom Studios, his comic book company. This is a comic book called Eve. And it's about this young black woman who's tasked with reseeding the earth and actually saving the planet. Yeah, it's a lot. It's so good. I, I, I think uh, it's been optioned by this company called Monkey Paw, I think. Oh, no. You ever heard of it? It's tiny. A little bit. Well, let's tiny. just hope that they do it well. Yeah, exactly. I don't know. There's some, I don't know. Anyway, <laughs> but no, seriously, though, this is, uh, this is a pretty amazing, um, pretty amazing story. Yes, yeah, beautifully done. Victor is an amazing writer. Amazing writer. He has two uh, shows coming out based off his own work, which is mostly horror, actually, but it's good horror. <laughs> like, how are you so scary? He's such a nice man. Anyway, um... The other thing is uh, black people are using technology or science fiction tropes to reconcile the past in order to move forward without trauma. So this is a, this is an, a concept that I call Sankofa-ration. So if you know um, the Sankofa term, right, it means go back and get it, or it's never too late to learn from the past, right? The aeration part comes from like narration. So I made a portmanteau of Sankofa and narration, right? Because every time I look at things that are considered to be Afrofuturist, I see that we're constantly having the burden of having to fix the past so we can move forward. We gotta fix it first because it's been jacked up. Not our fault, right? So, yeah, so this is a, a scene from um, Deep Space Nine. It's an episode called uh, Far Beyond the Stars where Captain Benjamin Sisko is actually having this traumatic incident and he's imagining himself as a black writer in the 1950s, science fiction writer. It's uh, Avery, Avery Brooks, have you seen this? I, I was like, I remember this. Yeah, Avery Brooks directed it too. It's oh my God, phenomenal. It's so amazing. Phenomenal. That breakdowns, oh my God. He, yeah. Other things, of course, Lovecraft Country. This is from, from the episode called I Am, right? If that ain't Afrofuturist, <laughs> it's like Afrofuturist like, is like a whole planet inside of Afro. <laughs> it's amazing, right? Where she basically becomes the technology. Uh, Anjali Ellis' character, Hippolyta, Hippolyta, right? She plugs directly into like the cortex of the universe. She becomes the technology, right? Another one, right? Y'all started saying this, see you yesterday. This is what I'm talking about. This young lady here creates time travel, right? Creates time travel. Her brother gets killed by a cop. She can't go and be Harriet Tubman or like Mark Twain or nobody. She got to go back and save her brother first before she can even go to school or anything. See, that's what I'm talking about. We don't, we don't, we, it's not escapist, right? It's utilizing time travel to deal with social issues, right? One of, I, was, I saw a presentation on this once, right? Uh, have y'all seen the movie? How many people have seen the movie? This one. Yeah? So you know how it ends, right? It's a, it's a cycle. Somebody got to die, right? One of my friends said, you know what? It's almost like racism is so powerful that it bends the laws of physics around it. And I was like, wow. That's deep. And it's like, and that's, that's, that's crazy. This is from an episode of The X-Files called um, Red Rum. And it stars uh, Joe Morton. And it's about a man who has wrong, he's, he's kind of bent, he's lied, right? And he's in jeopardy and he's in prison and he's traveling backwards through time, right? But I love the opening shot. It's a spider web, y'all see that? And that's the first piece. I was like, is this a Nazi the spider? Who's the king of lies? He uses lies to teach us things, right? Is this a Nazi? Like, is this an Afrofuturist piece, right? If you've ever seen X-Files, Mulder and Scully are, Scully are always narrating, right? And this one, Joe Morton is the, the narrator. It's almost like it becomes a black episode because it's about this man dealing with the fact that he's actually broken the law and he's paying for it. So he's given a second chance. I don't know, have y'all seen this episode? It's a spider web, I'm sorry. I'm sorry, it's dark. <laughs> I think there's a face behind it. There's a face behind it, yeah, so he's in, the, he's in his bunk. And there's a spider web in the, in the bunk, and you can. And so the first thing you see through the shot is through the, through the web. That's what made me think like, this is this is on purpose. Through the web. Through the web. Yeah. Right. Of course, other shots from I am from from uh, from Lovecraft Country, and this is from uh, Rewind 1921, where she again becomes like the portal. She is the time travel mechanism. Right. <laughs> 
I mean, quite literally, it's quite like literally. flowing through her body in That's order to do it. Yeah. So this idea of like black folk as technology, oh man, I needed this scene so much. You remember this scene? It was like, because we were in the middle of the George Floyd hearings and stuff, I needed to see a black person who was impenetrable, who was unstoppable. She was, it's just a beautiful scene. It just, and then of course the opera that was based off of Sonia Sanchez's words, it was just one of the blackest things I've ever seen in my life. <laughs> right. Of course, Sankofa, how did you remember this? So again, we're talking about a time travel story where the slave castle is almost a mechanism for time travel. It's, it's, it's a possession narrative, but also it's a, it's a recollection of a past or, or, or a reconciliation of the past, too. Anyway. I mean, all of this is just amazing. Oh, and this one, I... Justin Kim? Just the idea that there's a, a young black boy in the center of, of this is just, I mean, it, it just, just hadn't, visually, yeah. it just hadn't been seen that much anymore. One mm -hmm. of the things I've noticed is I, like, I have teenagers, and when I'm looking for books for them, um, for a very specific reason, we have become very female-centric and elevating women, which yeah. is amazing, but what I notice is that there are no books with... It's a dearth, it's a dearth of, and I've noticed that too, and so... What's it's happening? shocking, it's, I can't it's like you over, you over, um, yeah. compensate. The pendulum right? swung and so far, far, so far. Like, I can think of, like, Tristan Strong, Strong Punches the World. You know that book? Yeah, so they have comic books based off of Tristan Strong as well, and that, that writer just got an imprint with Disney now, too. So, but yeah, I want to center that pendulum a little bit more. I mean, we're getting into publishing stuff I do, too, but this is a remarkable film. I, this is so Afrofuturist, actually. It, it doesn't present itself like that at first until the very end. You're like, oh, my God. This is, I'm not going to spoil it for you. Watch this movie. I was like, what? And Dennis Quaid's in it. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Um, Sun Ra. This is from uh, Space is the Place. I'm talking about a, 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 an African science fiction identity that's coming from the future past to save all the black folk from destruction on the planet. But he also is playing this other black man for the soul of the universe. I mean, it was, it, was like, uh, it was like the Seven Seals, but funky. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> it's crazy. Of course, David Kirkman's Underneath, which is out and about now. And Infinitum by, Stephen, uh, by, by, uh, by Tim Fielder. So it's about this, this is a graphic novel from HarperCollins, right? And it's about a man who was a king. And he basically uh, takes the, his wife isn't able to bear children, right? And so his, he, steals the, he steals the baby of his concubine, one of his concubines, takes her takes him. She curses him to live forever. And he does. He can't die. He lives from pre-African kingdom all the way into the end of the world. Like, and, it's, and so it's like, it goes from like magical stuff all the way through slavery, civil war, until the end of time. It's called Infinitum. It's like one of the most amazing books. Anyway. What, what I am loving about this though is it we have had so many kind of sci-fi movies that reinterpret things where, you know, what little culturally we have held on to, our ancestry, science fiction takes away. Mm -hmm. Like there are people who are come back from pl other planets and suddenly they created the pyramids. Suddenly everything that, you know, was, has been socially proven to be us is now like, well, it couldn't have been you, right. therefore it must be an alternate reality. And what I'm loving about this is that no matter how technologically advanced it is, black people stay at the center. Mm -hmm. Like, we are still the ones wielding it, we are creating it, we understand it, which is like such a big thing, because half the time people make things and then they're like, I don't know what this is, and somebody else sweeps in to explain it. But we are the controllers, we are the understanding of how to do it. And yes. yeah, all no. of these are amazing for that. You know, that's, that's totally true, and I think about what you're saying is like, you look at something like Hidden Figures, which I actually kind of think is Afro Futures too, because it's, it's, it's talking about the futures in the space program and stuff like that, but these women were geniuses, right, yeah. geniuses. So when I saw like Hippolyta, like figuring out the mathematics on how they make that, uh, that, that or, or, orrery, that's a hard word, is it orrery, <laughs> work, right? It was like Hidden Figures, like she was figuring it out in her head, like I can't, I'm like, wow. And, and, and the fact that Atticus could actually like decode this ancient language, it's like, these people were geniuses. But here's the thing, in a Lovecraft story, right, by H.P. Lovecraft, usually that would be a white man who was like really, really well educated, 
right? I mean, how, how many of y'all have read H.P. Lovecraft stories? They're all about like people that are like him, where he's like, how it's do you beautiful mind. Right, it's beautiful, exactly, yes. And, but it's all these people that are working like this. And you have people like a beautiful artist, like D is an artist, right? Anyway, um, one of the things about Afrofuturism is like, you know, and I would say this, is that, first of all, black folk were never meant to be people. We're never meant to be, supposed to be. Nothing more than objects, right? So during slavery, we were, the, we were technology, we were soft machines. Extensions of the master's whim, right? So what happens when people that were technology actually wield technology? That's what Afrofuturism is about, you know? Um, Project Power, which I found really, I like Project Power, <laughs> you know? Um, very simple story, like Jimmy Fox is trying to find his, his daughter and she's part of this uh, experimental program where this, this pill gives you superpowers and it's an addictive drug, right? But she's a healer, you notice that, right? She, when she touches you, she can heal you, right? Not destructive. His power is destructive, but hers is, is about healing, which I thought was really wonderful. Um, black women are also centered more and have a lot more equity in, in their representations in Afrofuturism, right? Most of the top writers in Afrofuturist works, black women, right? Yeah. And it seems to be a lot more equitable than traditional science fiction and fantasy writing. Fantasy writing, yeah. Um, look at something like Fast Color, right? Even though it wasn't, it wasn't a, um, a white writer, right director, but it was almost like if Octavia Butler wrote the X-Men, is that right? I mean, that's what it felt like to me. You know, the new mutants, you know? Yeah. Um, I think it's such an interesting thing, though, because black women are at the center of it, and it is so kind of Mother Earth, Mother of Creation, you know. Mothership. Mo yeah, Mothership. It's like, <laughs> it all kind of comes out of the same uh, soul and being of it all, and so it's tapping into that. I want to, I want to ask you a little bit about, without you know derailing, because you create so much. I want to talk a little bit about world building, because I know we have a lot of creatives here who are who are making things, and I want to know your process of when you start a project. How do you go about building a world, and what are the questions that you ask yourself so that you can answer them creatively? Um, it depends on, some, I think about story as problem solving. You know, my background is in design, and design is storytelling as well, right? So if you're, if you're making a, a bottle, right, it has a story connected to it. It has, you know, if you're branding something, it has a story connected to it. You know, we're made out of stories. You know, our, the self is just a story that we keep editing till we get it right, right? It's, it's just, that's how we make sense of the world. The first story is with, you know, mythologies and things of that nature, right? Um, so storytelling always has like a nugget of truth in it and a nugget of you know fiction in it as well, and I think it depends on the st on what I'm trying to solve. Like for instance, uh, I have this, this uh, graphic novel called Box of Bones. Elevator pitches, uh, Afrocentric Hellraiser, right? Got it? Okay, yeah, it's terrifying. It's not right. You know, I didn't even put it in here. It's scary. It scares me. But it came out of the fact that I kept seeing all these black people being shot and killed, all these crying mothers, all this lack of justice, you know, still happening, right? Um, where does that go, right? The problem is like, where does that go? Where does that energy go? You know, the grief, you know, the pain. So I created a story about a box that punishes people that hurt black people. And in it are these creatures that are, um, Probably some of the most terrifying things you can imagine. Like, for instance, there's a creature in there called the Wretched, and it's a sentient lynching tree, right? So it's alive. It's actually like a, it's a monkey face at the bottom, and as it's picking these, fall out the tree, and they can turn you into picking these, and they, and they turn you into stereotypes, right? There's one, it's called the Nobody, you know? Uh, came from the song, you're like, Nobody knows the trouble I see, right? So it's about the emptying out of black culture. So I speak through the symbols, like what are these things kind of, what are the problems they're trying to solve? Now, I did create this world when I was at Harvard called um, the Cyber Trap, right? It's so looking at the fact that a lot of cyberpunk narratives were still not necessarily Afrocentric, they're still like, a, they were like speaking more to Asian culture, you know? So what I did is I actually decentralized that narrative and I put it in a, in a futuristic South. So the first thing I started thinking about is like, what are the technologies looking like and how are they manifesting themselves in design? You know, what are the artifacts that we're wearing? Um, how does design function with technology? You know, 
what are the different what, what what does language sound like that kind of thing so so for instance when you're usually doing science fiction writing you you have a thing what they call the effective novum the new idea right so it could be time travel it could be cyborgs it could be interstellar travel whatever that's the fictive idea right and then you create things around that idea so how does a new technology affect society like say for instance can you imagine the first time you know a car was driving on the street you know like what is that thing you just almost ran over my horse right change the world right even the idea of the stuff that we take for granted we have more computing power in our pocket now than was on a space shuttle it's crazy we see more images now in a day than someone in the 17th century saw in their whole lifetime we live in the future right so how does that shift you know so those are the things i think about like design technology and how it actually changes what they call the technologia like how does it actually like reshape everything so that's what i start with is like okay this new technology exists what language pops up now you know i mean if you imagine like talking to yourself like 10 years ago like hey man you got a new app what are you talking about <laughs> what an iphone what are you talking about? all these different language things so so that's that's what we start with with the mundane the other thing the last thing is that in order for for a technology to transfer transform uh society it has to be commodified and become mundane it can't be special anymore it can't be special can't anymore be special it's got to be in the fabric that's right so for instance if you create like a car everybody got, i mean a lot of people got a car right most people got a car right especially in la, in LA. um it has to become affordable it has to be something that's trans in order for it to be transformative it has to be ubiquitous you see so that's the thing too it's like the fictive novel becomes mundane and that's when it becomes part of a real world setting to me. I mean, I think, race. And I, I think it's fascinating though that yeah. ultimately the key to building a world is solving a problem that can only be done through the new world. Like, if obviously, if we could solve it here, it yeah. would be done already. Right. And a lot of times, you know, science fiction is talking about problems that we're dealing with right now, right? Um, but it gives us a certain amount of distance. You know, people, it's not real, so it's, it gives a certain amount of, like, arm's length, right? In the near future, you know, that kind of thing, right? Even though we can see it right out, our, out outside the door, you know? So, yeah. Can we talk a little bit about the intersection of the, the concept of Afrofuturism um, as it relates to both, like, these are two very different things, but I kind of, I'm hoping you can find a way to handle them both. Um, hip hop culture, mm -hmm. and also kind of the comic and graphic novel, uh, what the ability to expand on things through comic and graphic novel. Okay. Um, first of all, like if you look at the original um, article by Mark Derry, it's called Black to the Future, and it's illustrated by five illustrations, right? Four of them are comic book illustrations, right? Two of them are from Milestone Media, and the other two are from uh, Why I Hate Saturn, which is a book by Kyle Baker, really talented. It was a great book, by the way. And y'all, you, know, you guys know who Ramel Z was? Ramel Z? Y'all don't know hip hop. Anyway, yeah, Ramel Z was breakdancer, graffiti artist, and um, he was doing cosplay when cosplay wasn't a thing. He would do these performance pieces and stuff like that. Have you ever seen, like, the sound suits by, um, oh, I can't remember his name right now. Oh, don't get old. Anyway, um, hip hop is all about technology, right? Hip hop is about reappropriation of technology, you know? Um, it's about taking things and through bricolage, through remix, realigning them to suit you. Stealing technology. I mean, you know, the first the first hip hop uh, shows were like stolen electricity, right? DJ Cool Herc was like, you know what? We're about to jam. Uh, let's go plug this in this wall over here and steal this electricity, and we're gonna take something that was made for playback and make it into an instrument, right? We're gonna actually like take a box that a refrigerator was in and turn it into a break dance to a floor, right? And we're gonna stop time, right? I think hip hop is all about time travel, right? So, for instance, if you see like wow style graffiti it takes you a while to read it, it stops you in your tracks like, man that's nice what does that say it stops you right and what does somebody do at the end of a breakdance move they freeze right 
It's like, look at what I just did. It's dope, <laughs> right? And what does a DJ say? You know, it's like, and on, and on, and on, and on. Bring that beat back. I mean, it's all about time travel. It's all about, like, bending time. You know, what is, what is the break? What does that even mean? Right? I'm, I'm asking you for real. What does it mean? <laughs> Right, and the, and the idea is to extend it, right? So what, what so what a, what a DJ is doing is actually taking that break and making it as long as possible, and that's the break. That's why they call it break dancing, right? That's time travel. What a DJ is doing is actually juxtaposing pieces of time side by side, almost like a imagine like a, a acoustic quilt, right? I have, a, I have a character called Kid Code that I made it with my friend Stacy Robinson and Damian, Damian Duffy. He jumps through a, like a cosmic quilt. He time travels through like a quilt and. He calls it a needle drop. He said, drop me a needle in 1964. And he goes, he's a hip hop, like superhero, like it's like Doctor Who meets like uh, Africa Bambada. Yeah. So yeah, so that's one piece, right? There was about technology. So you have people like, you know, MF Doom and, you know, um, Deltron 3030, right? Where they're creating like um, Identities that are sci-fi identities. Bobby Digital, right? The RZA, right? All this, this is all, this is all tech. This is all sci-fi, you know. So as far as comics go, like I said, comics were already connected to that, right? So the first Afrofuturist images were like comic book images, you know. So Milestone Media, right? Static Shock, you know, all these different characters, you know, they get their powers through like either technology or mutation or something like that. But we're also looking at stuff like Brother Man, right, which is taking place in another uh, alternative universe, or like the work by Nia Comics from the 1990s, uh, Turtle on Lee's book, uh, uh, Malcolm 10, where he's like 10 of the greatest black people cloned into one body. You know, this is 1990. You know, this is amazing stuff. So yeah, all this is, you know, this is happening right now too. Like Victor Laval's Destroyer. Y'all familiar with this book? She's like, yes. So imagine if. Frankenstein's, if Dr. Frankenstein was a black woman whose son had been killed by a cop and she brings him back from the dead with nanotechnology to destroy the world. That's what that is. She's like, I brought you back to destroy everything because she is angry. Right? It's a beautiful she's, book. She's got to burn it down. She's got to burn it down, exactly. It's a great book. You know, also stuff like, uh, this is from Brazil. This is a book that I'm publishing, actually, on my imprint, uh, Megascope. It's a book by Hugo Canuto. So imagine if Jack Kirby, who co-created the Marvel Universe, was Bahia from Brazil. <laughs> so, so it's called Tales from the Orisha. So like instead of Shango, we, instead of Thor, we have Shango, right? We have, so all of the, the different characters that are in um, the Marvel Universe are, are mimicked through, you know, so he's taking like the Jack Kirby piece, and it's, yeah, it's beautiful, right? It's beautiful. I know, it's beautiful, <laughs> it's crazy. Um, it looks so a little bit like Doctor Strange. Uh, I had to put that in there. I'm sorry. Grab it. <laughs> this is my character from Marvel. Ah. Yeah, so basically what I did is I took a character that was created by Stan Lee in 1969, who is a black physicist who saves, who saves the world, and the Silver Surfer puts a cosmic flame on his grave to mark him as a hero for eternity. And I was like, I asked Marvel, I was like, why is he dead? <laughs> that doesn't make any sense. The Fantastic Four got their powers from cosmic rays, right? So... I brought him back as Ghostlight, you know, this character. And so it just started, it's, it's, it's in stores now. So that's the idea of sampling and remix Sankofa. The, the, the piece in the middle where he has a sound of circle, that's a Sankofa egg. That's what, that's what that stands for. That's amazing. Um, Thank you. I want to, uh, something that you said actually really keeps kind of going through my head about how, uh, to, to uh, go back to music for just a second, about how it's all about time travel. Mm -hmm. And, I, and how you how it's created is and from technology, and I realize mm -hmm. it is taking a futuristic take on past technology. That's right. Like we have the turntable, we had that forever. They found a futuristic way of working with something from the past to create something new. You're trying to make something uh, uh, futuristic sounding, you know, like you know this. What does that even say? You know, that's yeah, it's not found in not even like typical language. world. Right. But um, also too, like Common, you know, he has a song called Time Travel, Time Travel, Time Travel, Time Travel. You know that song from uh, like Water for Chocolate? Mm -hmm. It's all about time bending. You know, they're, 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 they're magicians. Greg Tate said that the DJ culture is like ancestor worship. Because you're literally taking like artifacts 
done by our ancestors and representing them, juxtaposed with new sounds and beats. It's, it's just genius. It is. I mean, it, it really does kind of. We already have our cultural worship of hip hop for it being the creative force that it is. But in in this context, it has such a broader, grander origin story, if you will, of how how technologically advanced it brings people. That's right. Um, I'm gonna start taking questions um, in about I don't I don't know three minutes. Um, depending on if I get through all mine, uh, I will definitely get some. Um, I, I do want to just touch for a second on how did you get here? How did you find this love of Afrofuturism? Oh, okay. I well, want to make sure we like let me go get your this. origin story. Let me go back. <laughs> Time travel. <laughs> started with these images right here all right so I was actually um, it's like year 20, 2007 or something like that and I was a diversity scholar in residence in, in the academy when you put diversity in front of it you're gonna get some money for it because you know that's how we roll um, I was at uh, James Madison University and it was really cool I, I went there for like two weeks and I talked to talk to the students and stuff like that and they give you an art show a year later right so instead of doing like a retrospective, I wanted to create new images. And so I was getting ready to go to Japan. I was, I was actually, I actually curated a show there. And I was looking at Japanese techno culture. And I think I recently reread like Franz Fanon's The Fact of Blackness, re fairly recently. And so I started thinking about like the idea of the cyborg, the cybernetic organism as a trope for like stereotypes, right? So the word stereotype is a printing term, by the way. It comes from the printing parlance, right? It's created in the 1800s. And then it starts to be used as far as like uh, people in the 1920s by this guy named Walter Lippmann, right? And I started thinking about like the fleshy part of the cyborg being like how we see ourselves, right? And the, the robotic part being like the, the socially constructed aspects of what it means to be black. So it's like double consciousness, right? And I just started doing research on these old images and I made these images over, it's about 70 of them, over about a four day period. I felt like I was, like they were just coming out of me. This is all digital work. And so this book, so this piece is called um, uh, Matters of the Fact, right? And it's about the idea that stereotypes get reproduced over and over and over again. It's the nature of them. A friend of mine said, these look Afrofuturist. And I was like, you're making up words. <laughs> That's not a word. So when I started doing research, I said, realize that, wow, a lot of my ideas are jiving with this idea of Afrofuturism, you know? And so that's when I, you know, it's a little bit after I came up, I first came across Octavia Butler's work and then um, other artists and a, a really big transformative piece for me, so many of these things actually, is this film, um, The Last Angel of History, 1997, directed by John Okonfora, who's uh, English, uh, he's an African man, but grew up in it. England and it's about the history of digital music actually like techno music and like funk and all this kind of stuff right and uh, he talks to science fiction writers too it's about 40 some odd minutes or something like that maybe a little bit longer um, Octavia Butler's on it uh, Sam Delaney's on it but he came up with this this guy he's a he calls him a data thief he uses the idea of the data thief as a trope to lead us to the story the data thief is a time traveling archaeologist who was time traveling, putting together pieces of black history throughout. And I was like, what? So I just, it blew my mind. And so at the beginning of it, he talks about um, the Robert Johnson story. You guys know the Robert Johnson story, right? He's a blues man, Delta blues man. He goes to the crossroads and he sells his soul to the devil, right? And, um, but what he says is he gives him a black secret technology and he called it the blues. And he has an English accent, he's called the blues, right? And I was like, I'm, I'm from Mississippi and I grew up with that story and I grew up, grew up with the blues and I never thought of it as a technology. And I was like, this blew my little mind. And so first thing I did is I made a series of blues images. It's called Thief at the Crossroads. I actually showed these in Mississippi first, you know, it was a series of 12 images of, of class. That's Mississippi Fred McAfee, Bessie Smith, uh, Howlin' Wolf, right? And so, yeah, and so I just wanted to, this B.B. King, my homeboy, right? Muddy Waters, and 
talk about Sanko Formation. But I also started making books around the same time with other people who are like-minded. So like Natasha Womack's book, I did the cover for that. I actually started making the images that started to address visually what Afrofuturism was. And so kind of stumbled into becoming someone who actually kind of guided the aesthetics of it in this new iteration. It's by accident. I just happened to be talking to the people who were making these books. So this is all stuff that I've done over the last like decade or so as an artist. So if you, if you Google Afrofuturism, a lot of times my images will pop up, you know. Um, this is a very important event. This is a lot That's a big flex right there, too. <laughs> like, if you Google Afrofuturism... Some of the things that pop up I might have made. <laughs> so, actually, this image here is probably one of the most... This image on Afrofu Afrofuturism 2.0. Me and my friend Adelie Funama, who teaches at Loyola Marymount University, we came up with these two Afrofuturist think tanks, pre-Black Panther, right? So what's interesting about hip-hop, right, is the academy thought it was nothing, right? They just thought, oh, it's just noise, it's just gonna, it's a flash in the pan. The first, this is the 50th anniversary of hip-hop being created, right? Created in the 70s, right? The first major book on hip-hop doesn't happen until the 90s. Trisha Rose's book, Black Noise. So they ignored it for 20 years, and look what happened, right? Afrofuturism, this particular iteration, has been guided and pushed by scholars like myself before this mainstream mainstreamification of, of Afrofuturism. Overnight sensation that takes decades. About 14 years. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. And we knew that if something like Get Out happened or Black Panther happened, that this would happen. It would, it, when Black it, Panther came out, I was, you know what, I was, <laughs> I was interviewed 22 times. Wow. One of the main questions was like, what's the difference between Black Panther and Black Panther Party? For real. Yeah. I, 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 it's hilarious. But yeah, seriously though, it's like, it, it was, it's been wild. And so the other thing that I, I'm a theorist, right? So I was looking at um, the fact that a lot of these Afrofuturist works were being made by people who were on the ground um, organizers. And that's what came with this term, the Black Speculative Arts Movement, which is where, I, which is where we are, you know? Anyway, so Black Kirby, I just go through stuff. But anyway, yeah. So I want to make sure, before I go to questions, I want to make sure that we give the promised Afrofuturism starter kit. Oh, I start with uh, the Afrofuturism book by Yatasha Womack. Um, Mothership, which is the book uh, that Bill Campbell and Ed uh, Hall put together. Actually, uh, now there's an Afrofuturism podcast that's been put out by Carnegie Hall because Carnegie Hall did an eight-week Afrofuturism festival wow. that shows you how mainstream Afrofuturism is. The Blacksonian, that's what I call it, the Blacksonian is about to have an Afrofuturist show. That's what I call the National Museum for African American. It's called Blacksonian. Anyway, March. It's going to be up for a year, a full year. It opens March 24th. You could just go there, but there's a book that they're publishing that comes out in March that is one of the, it's a big companion of that. If you want to go really, really deep on like some of the more theoretical stuff, Afrofuturism 2.0 and this other book called Black Speculative Arts Movement that is co-edited by Dr. Ronaldo Anderson. So. And if you could pick one comic book or graphic novel, you can pick your own if you want, that you think everybody should read or own, mm. what would it be? I mean... You're, you're allowed to pick your own. Ah, I mean, I think that betw it's between like Kindred, the, our Kindred graphic novel that we did for Abrams, and probably Infinitum by Tim Fielder. I think Tim, Tim Fielder's Infinitum covers a lot of stuff. You know, he was making Afrofuturist work back in the day, way before we, people were even thinking about it. And the Kindred graphic novel, I think, is probably the first major like graphic novel that relates to black speculative culture that was successful. It was like number one in New York Times, but still blah, 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 all that stuff, right? And everybody should know Octavia Butler's work, period. So, yeah. yeah. And, and if there was one uh, novel? Well, for, can, I do a, can I do a book collection? Sure. Okay, I would say Sherry Renee Thomas's Dark Matter, right? Came out in 2000. It's the first, it, it, it's, the, it's the book that actually recalibrates how we look at, like, black literature. Because, for instance, a lot of people don't realize that Du Bois wrote science fiction, right? He, W.E.B. Du Bois wrote, a, wrote a, 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 a short story called The Comet, 1920, right? About the end of the world, it's a black man and a white woman, and they survive, right? And all this idea of like race falls away, and it's about a comet, it's a post-apocalyptic sci-fi story, right? It's in this book. Now, what's interesting, though, is that 
2015, um, some people found in his papers a previously unpublished science fiction story called The Princess Steel, in which he creates this, this thing called the Megascope, which is where I get my name and my imprint from, is a device that can see through time and space. And he uses it as a framing mechanism for a metaphorical fantasy story about his critique of the U.S. steel industry because he's a genius. 1909 he wrote this, 20 years before the term Afrofuturism was even conceived by Hugo Gernsback. 20 years before science fiction existed, I mean, it, sorry, I'm like, I don't mean to yell at you, but I'm just saying, I just get excited, I'm a big nerd. Do y'all know this? I'm sorry, I'm a big nerd. Anyway, 20 years. Uh, that's yeah. amazing. Yeah. But it also is, you know, yeah. speculative of a future where we want to see what we want to see, so we have to create it. That's right. That's right. Which, you know is the basis of how we are, it's the reason why we're here, because if we hadn't imagined a better world, we couldn't have survived where we were. Exactly so, right. um, I'm going to let y'all ask questions, because I know, I mean, we could just chill up here, but that wouldn't be fair. Um, so, there's a microphone coming around, and certainly, Mr. in the gray. Hi, thank you so much. Um, uh, so I have a question when it comes to the umbrella term right now of Afrofuturism, mm. because as you said earlier, we have N.K. Jemisin is an Afrofuturistic author, but her stuff leans more towards fantasy. Right. And as we move into the future, um, Afrofuturistic content becoming more mainstream, does there need to be another overarching term? And you said like black speculative art movement, mm -hmm. and is that is that what it's all falling under rather than Afrofuturism? Well, here's the thing. I, I think black speculative art or black speculative thought, even though it's a mouthful, see, one of the things is like stuff is catchy, yeah. right? Afrofuturism just sounds good on the, in the, on the mouth. Right? It's like, oh, Afrofuturism, it sounds good, right? And people, it's, it's, it's really buzzy, you know? Uh, my friend Nadia Korofor, she says, I don't write that. I write African futurism. Most of her work takes place on the continent of Africa, right? So it's African futurism, right? So one of the first things that happened when we started thinking about, like, Afrofuturism, as you said, a global term, is, is actually, like, pushing back about two things. Some people had an issue with the fact that a white man came up with this term, right? It's a good, good gentleman, Mark Derry, uh, was very supportive of this new iteration of some people have called it Afrofuturism 2.0, which is more inclusive, right? Um, I did have an issue with the fact that, you know, genre was being totally uh, ignored. Because as you said, like N.K. Jemison writes mostly fantasy. She has done horror, she has done science fiction. I would say like uh, the city that we became is probably like weird fiction, right? Which is a sci-fi story to a certain degree, right? So I think it depends, right? Um, black speculative art, I think is a really good, or black speculative thought is a really good umbrella term for all these things. But you also have like this, this, the, the resurgence of the idea of the Afro surreal, right? With shows like Atlanta and things like that. Um, speculation, I think, is really important to, um, as Darren is saying, the, the idea of survival in the space, right? You know, you have to imagine yourself in a better space. That's uh, if you ever read the book Freedom Dreams by Robin D.G. Kelly, it's about the black radical imagination. You have to imagine yourself in a space first before you get there. Dr. King was an Afrofuturist. I challenge you right now to take out your phones and find that mountaintop that he was talking about. Does not exist in this reality. And we still haven't gotten there, right? These are powerful ideas, prototypes that we can create. Um, these days, I think of the Afrofuture as a destination. I think it's after I had my kid, I was like, you know what? I don't know how we get here. I don't know what we're gonna call it. But it's important for us to get there together. And I don't know if we're doing horror, we're doing science fiction, whatever. It's important for us to get to the Afro future. Yes, because it's because a black future is still contentious in our country, as we just saw. I love that as a as a destination and not a, a genre. designation. Yeah, it's not a genre. That's very smart. You like that? I'm stealing that. That's okay because I can just use it on the starter kit because I can't write it down. Um, do we have another question? Oh, right here. Hi. Hey. My name is Tanisha. Uh, I would like to ask you a question. I feel like you should redo, you know, the, uh, what, what's that called, the Black Superman? I feel like Black um, Superman he has been brainwashed, you know, in the, in the mainstream media mm -hmm. 
hate to tell you, I mean, truth be told, but Superman was a uh, black, so I feel like you should uh, rewrite the, the comic book all over because how can a uh, Superman survive by a uh, kryptonite, right? So, well, here's the thing. So, there are several black Superman in DC Comics, actually. Uh, one is called uh, Val Zod, actually. So, there's, so you already have in, in that space black Kryptonians that are black Superman in other dimensions, actually. I think it's two or three, actually, already. And then, of course, you have a character like the Blue Marvel, which was created by Kevin Grievous, the black man who created the Underworld series. He created a character called the Blue Marvel that essentially is a Superman analog, right? And then you also have Icon from the Milestone Media piece, which is almost borrowed directly from, it's a remix of, of the Superman mythology. But I agree with you, by the way. I think, the other thing too is like, Superman gets his powers from absorbing solar energy, right? I mean, look at, that's what we do. Yeah, it makes sense that Superman would be a black character. I, mean, I love that she stood up and gave you like, an assignment. I love that too. <laughs> she was like, okay, for your next this thing. Is you, this is your next project. I'm like, okay. <laughs> <laughs> we have a question, in fact. I'll add it to my queue. Hi, I am Kelvin Garvan. I'm 64 years old. I grew up in Bed-Stuy, Brooklyn, New York. With the breaking, we were heavy into disco. Mm -hmm. So the breaking began with people separating from holding hands while dancing, and then new beats were created for people who wanted to break out of what we were doing in clubs like Ipanema. Right. The... Um, album that Henry, uh, Herbie Hancock came up with, Headhunters, was one of the first beats that came out of that. And probably one of the first rap songs I heard was King Heroin by James Brown. But in terms of thinking about this, I wanted just to toss out, what about like Sankofa mindset? Because as we reach to the back to go to the future, and looking at how we see ourselves in the future, like Du Bois did, like King did, like the last poet, what if we did not come from Africa, but to Africa? Mm -hmm. Maybe just, what do you think about Sankofa mindset? Oh yeah, no, I think that's, when I said Sankofa ration, I think that definitely you have to be in that proper mindset to think about it. Yeah, yeah. Sankofa, I think, is a huge part of Afrofuturism, yes. Because a lot of times we're having to reconcile or sample. I mean, to me, sampling and remixing is part of our culture. It's very syncretic in nature, you know? Um, yes, I think that's extremely important. You know, the idea of Sankofa not um, letting go of the past, but also keeping your eye on the future as well, simultaneously. Um, most of the images that I do that are about Afrofuturism have a person that's looking forward and back at the same time. That's why I do that, actually. So in some ways, that is a Sankofa mindset, yes. So I think that narrative structure comes directly from thinking about Sankofa in that way. And it's a, it's a critical curation, so to speak. You know what I'm saying? It's, like it's a very, like, um, like you're selecting particular things to send to the future, which is why I think about curation so much, actually. Cur curatorial work, yeah. Yeah, I'm sorry, I forgot about Lightning Lift and Smith. Oh. And also I forgot about Lightning Lift and Smith and Visions. Stevie Wonder. These are albums which you're reaching into that music taking us to the future. Yeah, yeah. Fantastic. I think Stevie Wonder's Afrofuturist. Hey, she's behind you. Oh, sorry. Okay. <laughs> My name is Melody. I got a quick question. You mentioned Afrofuturism, but then you also said Gothic. So Gothic is when you're in the present and you go back to the past? Well, um, so, so for us, it's like the, the traditional Gothic Revolution was actually kind of a critique of um, it was a darker side of romance, so to, so to speak. It was like it was a critique of like the industrial industrial revolution, that kind of idea. It was a sense of ennui around like losing touch with one's history and stuff like that. So if you see like a gothic romance, it's like these tortured spaces and haunted houses and you know these uh, and these mystical artifacts and you know stuff like that. And so so it was just I was thinking about it as a as a as a genre. And so what, so what I call ethnogothic is putting a kind of a, 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 an ethnographic spin on it, you know? I always talk about it as, say, like, you know that song by Erica Badu, Bag Lady? You know, in the story, in the song, back, you know, Erica Badu sees this bag lady, and she's dragging all these bags behind her, she's trying to get a bus, right? That's, and she tells her to do what? Let it go, let it go, let it go, let it go, right? So my whole thing is, like, you have to, like, 
unpack those bags, you know, through utilizing what I call the ethnographics and, and, and be like, okay, I'm letting go of this oppressive idea, I'm letting go of this like epigenetic trauma, I'm letting go of like, you know, the prison industrial complex, whatever, whatever's in that bag that's holding you down, let it go and then maybe you can jump on that bus to the Afro future. You know what I'm saying? So that's that's the connection. That's why I started thinking about this idea of genre a lot, you know. Um, the different genres have different utility they have different affordances, you know what I'm saying? So so we're literally like down to the last minute, and I I have a question, and I'm so afraid to ask it because I think we could probably go another hour on it. No, I don't do it. But I'm just I just want to see if I can get a sentence or two. I'll try I'll try to do a haiku. What is <laughs> an interpretive dance? Um, so much so many times when I see people talking about Afrofuturism, when they actually start talking about it, I hear a lot of people saying, "I'm writing." Uh, about vampires who can walk in in the sunlight, and I'm like, okay, how, how how is that coming around? What do you think about the kind of monster um, scenario in in this realm? Oh yeah, it's very. I mean, I, I definitely think that something like Get Out is an Afrofuturist horror story, right? Because of the speculative thing in those particular stories is technology, right? So if you think about the monsters, if you take technology and you push it to the to the to the end of where it can become, you get something like Black Mirror, right? You ever seen Black Mirror? Right. So it's like it becomes grotesque, it becomes monstrous, right? Blade for instance, okay? Let's look at the look Western Science Blade. I look at that more as a science fiction horror story because of the fact that vampirism was curable. It was like it was connected to science, you know? It wasn't like supernatural. So it depends on this how you're getting at the speculative, right? If it's a spirit, you know, like, you know, some people believe like a werewolf is an evil spirit that jumps in your body and turns you into a wolf. Or it could be lycanthropy and it's a, it's a virus that turns you into a wolf, you know? So depending upon how that speculative thing is being like uh, arbitrated, I think that's, yeah. So if you want to do a sci-fi horror story, I mean, yes, that's what alien, alien is a horror story, right? It's terrifying. It's terrifying. <laughs> anyway. Um, Thank you so much. I want to make sure that we at least acknowledge, um, while I have you here, that this weekend is the opening of Octavia's bookshelf in Pasadena. Oh, is it really? This weekend. Yes. So yesterday and today, I think today is its first official day. Oh, man. Um, so, you know, make sure that you go and support um, just anybody who opens a bookstore in this day and age, let alone a black woman. Doing the work of the uh, Seriously, I appreciate that. I gotta go and visit. Gotta go and visit. So, I wanna make sure everybody knew that, but everybody, please join me in thanking John Teresa for this topic all the way from New York. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Let's give them another warm round of applause for this great panel.